What's going on, Whisper Nation? We are back again with another episode, and we're continuing our breakdown series. And this time, we're talking about the NFC North. It's about to get scary up in here. Hopefully, Big Travis doesn't get scared because we're talking about the Lions, Tigers, and Bears on this episode of the Fantasy Whispers. Right here. That's right, Whisper Nation. We're talking Lions and Tigers. Well, not Tigers, but we are talking Lions and Bears. We're going to talk Packers which means Aaron Rodgers news. We're going to talk all that stuff. But first of all, Big Travi here with you. If you're seeing my face, that means you're watching on YouTube. Hit us with a like. Hit us with a subscribe. Help us out. We're going to grow the channel via the algorithms and the way the internet helps us out. If you're listening to us on Apple or uh, Spotify, please leave us a, a review. We That would help us big time. And then get over to YouTube and check us out over there. Subscribe as well. If you're new to the Fantasy Whispers in general, be sure to follow us on any platform you want by heading over to thefantasywhispers.com and checking out all the links we have. We're putting out content daily, Monday through Friday here in the offseason. But then when the season starts, man, it's every single day. We don't stop. So make sure you follow the Fantasy Whispers. Johnny, welcome in, man. We're talking that NFC North. I'm super excited to get into the show, obviously, because my Green Bay Packers, uh, big Green Bay Packers fan. So we get to talk about the Packers, the Cheeseheads. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but just in general, this is just a great division for fantasy purposes. When I was putting out the show need you know, I'm like, man, there's a lot to get into here. A lot of fantasy nuggets to talk about. Oh, it's going to get wild in this episode. I mean, Travis, they're going to, we're going to talk about some players and it, it could get a little emotional on this episode, uh, because we're, we are talking about some of those players that, you know, we are not only invested in, and as far as dynasty, but, you know, we, we've grown to attach the, to these players. And, you know, we got to we gotta either plant our flag or, or cast away. Yeah, and, for those of you that are uh, followers of the show, you know who he's talking about. He's talking DeAndre Swift, and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, in a couple teams down here, we're going to talk about uh, him as well. But I just I want you to, you know, realize, Whisper Nation, that we've got a lot to get into here, and it's time to start forecasting out what we're going to see, but then also be like water, as we always say, be able to change. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in our question of the day, Johnny, because right now we've got some news coming out about Antonio Gibson. So according to Edward Perez, well, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, Antonio Gibson came out and told the press that he's been dealing with that turf toe injury that took him out of a couple games last year and that it's been nagging him in this offseason already and that he's working through that and trying to figure out what that's going to look like. So then you look at Edward, Edwin Perez at FB Injury Doc on Twitter. He says, Antonio Gibson's toe. Best case, he rehabs through camp, wears an, wears, or weans off the foot plant, and we never hear about it again. That's the base case scenario. Likely case scenario is he rehabs through camp, continued use of the foot plate. He has some Wednesday DMPs and Twitter anxiety racks up. He misses 0.5 to 1 games throughout the year and has January surgery. The worst case, he has an in-game exacerbation plus surgery. So that's kind of the out the, the outcomes here, Johnny. My question for you is, this is probably his peak ADP before this news came out. Right now mm -hmm. on 4 for 4 fantasycom mm -hmm. he is going as RB15. That's in the third round in PPR, 303, RB15. And so my question for you is, this is his peak ADP. Are you still okay taking him peak ADP with this news? At 303, or does this slide him down for you? Are you actually concerned? Does this news mean something for you? This it, this news does mean something for me, Travis. Uh, listen, I was a big fan of Antonio Gibson this offseason. I was telling people, hey, go out and get him. I acquired him in a dynasty league. Really excited for his upside. And, you know, as far as dynasty goes, I still think the upside is there. So I would actually kind of use this information to go and try to acquire him on the on the on the cheap right now. However, if it's in a redraft league, Travis, and you're talking about that ADP, man, I I am now concerned uh, significantly because here's the reality, you know, and I'm going to quote in an article that, uh, you know, talking about this very thing. Right. So Gibson didn't need surgery after the season, but it appear, uh, but apparently been a slow process working his way from turf dough. All he still notices, and as well as he still notices pain and discomfort at times. That said, Gibson has been practicing with teammates at OTAs where he says he's been running and cutting at full speed. We also revealed that uh, he also revealed that 
He still needs treatment for the troublesome toe. Hopefully, eventually, get back to 100%. So this is something that we're definitely going to want to monitor. Like you said, Travis, in that tweet, when, when you're talking about physical therapists and stuff, we tend to believe them, you know, as fantasy analysts. And that's stuff scary when you're dealing with that in the offseason. Uh, it, it does throw up some caution flags. I think this will help correct his ADP. If he's maybe your, you know, your third why, uh, running back, if you go, you know, three straight running backs, or, you know, if he's your RB2, but you're still getting maybe in that third or fourth round, Travis, I think I'm okay with that still because the upside is definitely there. Like you said, like there is still reality that, you know, he can rehab this and that he, he comes back fine. But we do, unfortunately, have to look at that injury risk and say, OK, we have to adjust his ADP because of that. And then we also have to look at the history of this in injury with other players. And there is a sad truth that this does happen often where they need they do end up needing surgery or have to, you know, Julian Edelman had this. Uh, A.J. Green had this. And so there is a lot of concern for me. Are you a gambling man? That's where you have to kind of decide for yourself for fantasy football on where you want to gamble with that. I'm no longer willing to gamble in the second round with this information, but I want to keep it monitored because just last week it was it was it was crazy. Just last week, Travis, they were talking about how Gibson looked great and that they were expanding the playbook uh, to give him more receiving. And to be work. fair, Johnny, like he could still be looking great. And like, that's still probably the reality of it. And I think what we're looking at, Johnny, is a situation where he is just bringing up, he's being honest with the press and he's bringing up something that's just been a little bit nagging and he's like not coming back as well as he wanted to. But this is something that could happen where he's fine. They're, you know, they don't work a ton in these mini camps. So maybe it's something where he's fine. He gets enough rest in the off season between now and then, and he comes into the regular season fine. We're going to have to monitor interviews with him because it's showing he's showing that he could be honest. Let's see if he can be honest about the recovery and still be honest in a couple months. It's just something to monitor. But I do think as ADP gets drive down, it makes him a complete, uh, you know, bargain. Uh, maybe even at the fourth mm -hmm. and fifth round is your second or third running or, um, you know, your second, third running back, uh, if you, if you will. I mean, think about, think about how injuries played or the, you know, potential injury risk played in Alvin Kamara last year, right? That information about the, the epidural in the back came out, you know, weeks before drafts and all of a sudden Kamara was going, you know, he was like the third overall player drafted right. all the right. way back to the, you know, you are in our draft. He went like the eighth, eighth overall pick. And you saw like, oh, it didn't have any effect. So sometimes, like we said, you could take this information and go and get a player a little bit cheaper or use it to your advantage, you know, play it like you would, you know, anything else and uh, go and try to acquire him because we do ultimately think long term he's going to be fantastic. Yep, I agree. And we're going to have him and so many other running backs to talk about because it does feel like the first three rounds are just so running back heavy. We've got, speaking of running backs, we've got plenty in this division to get into. Every starting running back in this division is probably going within the first three rounds. And that's something you want to, you know, you love to see in a situation. But before we get into the NFC North and dive into that, I want to talk to Whisper Nation a little bit because it's about that time of year again, Johnny. We're dropping the draft kit. It's launching soon. It's going to be better than ever this year. Our draft kit is fully loaded with premium player projections and rankings, consistency charts, with over three years' worth of data, cheat sheets, strength of schedule, uh, and so much more. The TFW draft kit is on sale July 1st for just $15. But if you pre-order starting today, actually starting yesterday, you can get it for the incredible price of only $10. So head on over to the fantasywhispers.com to get your draft kit today johnny at that low price of ten dollars only so you better go over there and get it johnny I hey, swear to not, God, dude, if I, I if we work on this and you don't buy it this year like you tried to do last year i'm gonna come over there and beat you hey i i i don't know if i should be revealing this on this show but there is you know you know me i like to like figure out hacks and stuff there is a hack to get the the draft kit for free free travis there and is. that is, and yeah, and that's by signing up with the Patreon. If you that's are true. a Patreon uh, VIP member, then you get the draft kit included with that. So you get right. it for free. Patreon.com forward slash the fantasy whisper. So get over there and check Shameless it out. Plug. Johnny, Shameless we're plug. We're talking about the NFC North, which means we're going to go alphabetical, which means we're going to talk about the Chicago Bears first. So a little bit about the Chicago Bears. Obviously, Johnny, we know this team dealt with some quarterback issues, to say the least, last year. Mitch Trubisky, Nick Foles uh, cycling through there. You know, there's rumors that Matt Nagy, because of his play calling, was on the hot seat. 
Ryan Pace was on the hot seat. Oh, there, that was not a rumor. That was facts. Yeah, that is, that is facts. And he probably still is on the hot seat. And that's good. what's going to be an interesting dynamic to check out here is how they navigate this in Chicago with Andy Dalton. Because Andy Dalton has been called by Chicago Bears Twitter, QB1. He's been called by Matt Nagy as the starter. They basically guaranteed he will be the starter. That's not true. That's not what's going to happen. Justin Fields will start, and we'll get into that. And there's some other things working here, Johnny, but let's start with the quarterback position. We believe, as a, as a brand here, that it won't be Andy Dalton, as, as many people in our industry do. The ADP would suggest that nobody believes that it won't be Justin Fields because he's the only one being drafted. Yeah. Um, but let's talk Justin Fields and how you think he's going to navigate beating. Is it, you know, Will he be week one starter? Will it take a couple games? And how you should approach him, especially in redraft leagues, because I know a lot of people believe his Konami code, uh, to quote Rich Rebar, it, his ability to rush as a, as a passer as well is going to be what puts him over the edge. Are you comfortable drafting him in redraft leagues You know, in the same realm we're taking some of these younger quarterbacks as well? If I'm in a two-quarterback league, then yeah, I'm more inclined to draft him. However, if I'm not in a, in a two-quarterback league or a super flex league, I'm actually not going to draft him. I don't plan on drafting him. And it's not that I don't think Justin Fields is going to be good. I think he's going to be really good. I think he'll be good in that offense. It's not that I don't think that uh, Justin Fields will be you know, good for fantasy rosters. You talked about the Konami code, Travis. I believe he will be. But like you just said, Andy Dalton, as of right now, is quote-unquote the number one and the starter there. I do not see that in training camp, because we've seen how Matt Nagy will do this with other prospects as far as when they come in. He kind of wants to do it his way first to kind of prove himself right. And then as soon as it doesn't work, then he flips. And it's not to say that he doesn't want Justin Fields to start, because I think he does and the entire organization does. But I think he has to give Andy Dalton some games because he did back them. They did pay him so much money. I think they, they want to try to make it work, quote unquote, you know, like the ideal situation, let Justin Fields ride the bench all year, you know, get that, you know, quote unquote, backup experience, whatever that means. But the reality of it is like you said, Travis, Matt Nagy is on the hot seat. And so therefore, once the Bears start losing the, uh, you know, the first few games, then with Andy Dalton, then they will be forced to put in Justin Fields. Uh, so my imagination would be, or my imagination, uh, my image would say that it's probably going to be around game four, Travis, that they'll probably start to use Fields. And so that's why I'm saying don't draft him because let somebody else draft him, take your dart, throw on another player. And then once that player drops him, because they're going to want to go and get a stash, not a guy that's going to be, you know, who knows when he's going to be the starting quarterback. And then once that player drops Justin Fields, then you can go in, you got him completely free, get him off the waivers, pick him up, you know, two games, you know, like after the second week, all right, then throw him on your bench. Cause I don't foresee very long after that before uh, he'll be in there. But Travis, I, I wouldn't be drafting him necessarily because I don't think unless, you know, information does change, you know, and that does. happen. Yeah, we'll if you, you know, we get we get into August or, or, you know, early September and we know that, you know, Fields is going to be the guy they've announced it. Yeah. Then we're talking a different right. situation. But I love this strategy of just like, you know, take yourself a Matt Stafford or uh, Carson Wentz even. Um, and then pair it with the idea that you're going to monitor the waiver wire and scoop up Fields if necessary. Uh prior to you know him becoming the starter look at what week one or two and just kind of monitor the situation we'll help you kind of do that we'll be putting out waiver articles as well i want to talk about the running back room a little bit and really it's a two-man show obviously damian williams was added uh johnny is a depth piece but we project it'll be david montgomery and then Tariq cohen sprinkled in now we know how Nagy likes to use these guys uh differently in the red zone and kind of aggravate you but what we saw out of david montgomery was just an absolute onslaught um, of fantasy points last year in the back half, the last six, seven games. Johnny, I think the biggest question of David Montgomery, and that's built into his ADP this year, is are we going to see more of what we saw the last six games of last year, or are we going to see more of what we saw early on in his career and not being able to get it? Did he finally break through the wall of, of the NFL and, and what it would take to be a, a consistent runner, or was he just aided by a bunch of really, really nice matchups last year? Obviously, usually it's somewhere in the middle. But, Johnny, what is your take on Dave Montgomery? Are you all in this year on Dave Montgomery? 
I am a very big fan of David Montgomery. You're going to hear people on both sides of the fence who, you know, should he be where he's at being drafted? Do we believe in him? I totally understand the argument where people will say, well, he had all the opportunity. There was nobody else there. They had, uh, they had to go to him. They had to give him all those touches. And the touches were what made him a very good fantasy player as well as the matchups down the road. Well, matchups, we can't really, you know, dictate whether or not that those are going to line up that way. However, what we can look at is the situation and the opportunities. When you're looking at this backfield, we do know that Matt Nagy does like to use a one running back kind of system because it doesn't tip off the defense. Now, does that mean that David Montgomery is going to get, you know, 90% of the total touches? No, it doesn't. But what it does mean is that he's going to get the vast majority of the touches in both the, the running and the passing game. Tariq Cohen, we obviously know they will line him up all over the field. They like to use him in the slot, things like that. That's how he'll be used. He'll still get his, you know, normal touches. They'll sprinkle in some Damian Williams, in my opinion. I think he's just there for a depth piece. Maybe they go to him around the goal line if necessary, Travis. But I still think this is David Montgomery's job to lose. And I think that he proved down the road that he can really shoulder the load. That was what they were looking for. And he produced that. He was, you know, the best running back during that time. And I understand people are trying to correlate, you know, the injuries to the other players to his production, but we also have to look at his injury prior to that. And that had to play in into why he wasn't so productive in the beginning of the season as well. And, you know, I'm just looking at this, their openings, um, you know, their, their first few games, Travis, and tell me you, you, you're not a fan of this, right? Uh, you've got the, uh, Rams week one, that's a difficult matchup. Their defense is really good. Okay. But after that, you get the Bengals week two, you get the Browns week three, you get the Lions week four, then you get the Raiders week five. Yeah. So that is a very nice matchup, you know, as far as w when you're looking at the defenses from last, last year, only the Rams are really a difficult run defense there. And so I do think that he'll start off hot. And, you know, and then if you at that point, if you want to get off the boat, you're like, oh, I think he his stock is, you know, at an all-time high. I don't blame you after that because uh, then he has yeah, some, let that a little build bit more. value up. And I think this is what Stepmom Lauren said when we had her on the show a couple months ago. It's like you can get some name value for Dave Montgomery, and especially if he starts with four out of his first five games or against softer opponents. Yeah. Like if you start to see his use in the red zone and that concerns you, and we'll talk a little bit about it, obviously, when you're following us. But if you start to see some of that red zone dippage or some of these other things happening – you get an opportunity to sell him off at his extreme value there and instead of, you know, trying to ditch him when he's after a bad and, matchup or something like that. And then just doubling down on that info, Travis, the, you might want to try to sell him high in October because uh, then you go Packers, which we'll see how their defense. They were not a good run defense last year, but they could improve. But then you got Bucks, 49ers, Steelers, Ravens after that. So it might be a good uh, opportunity. A right there. Yeah. And then if well, also another yeah. opportunity to yeah. buy low on them yeah. and to get in. Yeah, the exactly. We won't get too ahead of ourselves here on this show. We just wanted to talk a little bit about Montgomery's outlook here. Any interest at all in Cohen, who is being drafted as RB 50 right now, according to four for four.com tours ACL in three games uh, in week three against Atlanta had six games with five or more targets in back in 2019 and was a top 30 running back in PPR. Johnny, are you okay taking him in the 12th round as a little bit of a PPR dart throw, or do you see some value in, in Tariq Cohen, or are you kind of just staying away? I'm just staying away from Tariq Cohen. In all honesty, if I'm going to grab another running back for the Bears, it would be Damian Williams because I do think his skill set is very similar to David Montgomery's. And I think that that's Might be a why better they receiver him. than Montgomery, too. Like, remember, that Williams is, yeah. was a guy who was used very heavily in Kansas City as the pass catcher initially. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, should something happen to Montgomery, I think his value is really nice as a guy who can stay on the field for them. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the wide receiving core, or should I say basically Allen Robinson's house, because that's usually who we are care about here with the wide receivers, John, Johnny. There's Allen Robinson, there's Darnell Mooney, obviously Anthony Miller. 
I think this is a one-man show, especially with the uncertainty. If we know that Andy Dalton's probably going to be there for at least two or three games, that's enough to scare me off of anybody else not named Allen Robinson. Do you agree with that, Johnny? Are you coming in to take Allen Robinson and it, and that's it? Or are you taking a dart throw late on Darnell Mooney or Anthony Miller? Travis, I have the man's jersey on the wall. Yeah. And I have that for a reason. Because I got to tell you about a little story where I had his jersey on the wall for, you know, a couple of years now. I had I've had it for a while. And I was asked by, you know, one of our league mates who asked me, why do you have an Allen Robinson jersey? Like, why do you have one? And I'm here to tell you, Allen Robinson, Travis, is the most underrated and disrespected wide receiver in the game right now. We had we had uh, Whisper Nation come and we had a, a DM today that was asking, you know, what wide receiver should I go out and target right now? And, you know, think about it now. I should have just said you should go out and try to get, uh, you know, Allen Robinson because he is so underrated and people don't believe in, you know, the Chicago Bears. They don't believe in Andy Dalton or Mitch Trubisky. But it doesn't matter in reality, Travis, because this guy has been still getting the job done. He's young. He's on a contract. You know, they're, they're trying to franchise tag him. So we do like players that are trying to prove that they, uh, you know, for more money. That's always nice. You know, it's an added little tip of the cap when we're uh, putting out the draft kit. We always like to note that. But check this out, Travis. It's not just that he, you know, has been producing. He's been averaging 133 targets per season when joining the Bears. You talked about this is basically the Allen Robinson house, and that's exactly it. He's had 150 targets over the last two seasons. Travis, don't see that changing with any of the pieces that they brought in or lack thereof. You know, you're talking about they could be getting rid of Anthony Miller, which would be actually removing a weapon. And check this out. He's only had, talk about consistency, Travis, and why you need to make sure you're getting Allen Robinson on your, it's like he's going in like the fourth round. It's actually preposterous because he has only had less than 10 fantasy points on 30% of his games uh, or over last year. And so you're talking from a consistency standpoint, getting over 10 fantasy points from what could be your wide receiver too. I wouldn't mind if he's my wide receiver one, to be honest with you, Travis. If I go running back, running back, and grab maybe a tight end or something or another running back, you know, if you have a measure wide receiver two, I think you have one of the best wide receiver rooms in the league as far as your draft would go because Allen Robinson is straight up. People don't know the true value of Allen Robinson. Any concern in your mind if Allen Robinson gets paired with a Justin Fields, which is likely the likely scenario? I mean, I think yeah. Dalton's not going to have a problem feeding Allen Robinson. He fed Amari Cooper in spurts last year. He's fed A.J. Green in his career, uh, even Tyler Boyd with A.J. Green. So we've had situations where he's been able to feed people consistently. And Allen Robinson has shown that he can play with almost any quarterback, too. Yep. So is that what you're going to ride on when, if a Fields were to come in and, and take some time to develop getting to his number one wide receiver? Absolutely. I love the fact that you brought up, you know, the Justin Fields uh, dilemma, because once again, we talk about having when you have information, you know, information, you can use it then to go and argue certain points to help get you guys a little bit cheaper or or whatnot. And I would use that. I would say, oh, Justin Fields, aren't you nervous? But like you said, what we've seen, I'll tell you right now. Justin Fields is a better quarterback than Blake Bortles. And Blake Bortles got uh, Allen Robinson to be a top 12 fantasy wide Bro, receiver. I don't need you talking about the future franchise quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, Blake Bortles, dude, like that. You're going to be popping Bortles? Yeah, dude. I love I love me some Bortles. Uh, I'm just Bortleberg. saying. I'm just saying. I think he's, he like you said, he's quarterback. No, I think I, I believe so as well. All right. Let's just, I just want to quickly talk about Cole Komet. I do think he's an interesting dart throw. We saw him come on a little bit at the end of last year, and we've seen that rookie quarterbacks, you know, we've seen that Dalton doesn't mind a tight end from now time to time. He was feeding Dalton Schultz a little bit last year. We also know. Uh, you know, and you think about Tyler Eifert's big years with Andy Dalton as well. But then Fields, if he comes in, we know rookie quarterbacks love the tight end. I think it'll be a nice safety net for him to look on Cole Komet. He remember Komet was the best prospect in last year's tight end draft class. It was a weak draft class, but this is a guy who kind of came on late. And I think, you know, we talk about the other wide receivers not wanting to touch, but I think Komet's a guy that's interesting enough to pair with another upstart tight end uh, with some upside, and I think you could end up uh, seeing some big dividends from that. I'm going to move on to the Detroit Lions, Johnny, because this one might take a little bit of time. we got to talk about some uh, things here. 
I, I want to skim. <laughs> I, I hate to do this to Jared Goff, who, uh, you know, gets a lot of uh, flack for not knowing where the sun sets or rises. He gets a lot of flack for building a golf course in his backyard in L.A. He got a lot of flack because he was traded to Detroit Lions. I feel bad for this guy. And now we're going to give him some flack, too, because I really just don't see a way where you're drafting him. Um, even in two quarterback leagues, I want to fade him. The offense just seems to be one that's not projecting to be very good. Not a lot of weapons around him. I think it all begins and ends with the running back room, Johnny. And I think that's where we need to start here and talk about your boy, DeAndre Swift. I need to, this is, this is something that's have been evolving. You obviously love Swift. You loved him last year. We've talked about what's going on with the Lions. We have the change of coach. We have Dan Campbell coming in. We've got him bringing in a guy like Anthony Lynn, who's been a running backs coach in this league for a long time, was just the head coach of the Chargers. Melvin Gordon, Austin Eckler. You look back to times with LaShawn McCoy in Buffalo. He's got some track record of using his guys and just being a guy that you want to you want to be involved with. This defense is bad. Matt Patricia has just gutted this team, and it's not going to look good for the next couple of years. Uh, they have a lot of draft picks in the next couple of years. They don't have a lot of players they can put out there right now. So a bad defense usually means we're going to play some catch up. It doesn't necessarily spell good for a running back, but you are all over DeAndre Swift. You're digging in your heels here. Talk to me a little, a little bit about the pros of DeAndre Swift because we're going to have to get into this Jamal Williams news that's with it too. But I want you to set it up here and talk to Whisper Nation why they don't need to worry about anything uh, with DeAndre Swift. Listen, we're over here in Detroit. I'm going to take you over to 8 Mile. Listen, I already know everything you got to say against me, Travis. It is He is in a crowded backfield. They are thinking about bringing in a guy named Todd Gurley who has no legs. And he does live in a out, trailer park they, with his mom. They, they did go out and get Jamal Williams, who is a good running back and who's fun to be around. But listen, I'm telling you right now, Look at what is going around on the landscape of fantasy football. And you, when you see this, you know, Travis asked me before the show, you know, you got to, is, is DeAndre Swift going to be a guy you're going to hang your hat on or uh, do all these, you know, cautionary flags concern you? And I have stuck by this man like a, a, a true partner because I'm going to sit here Whoa. and tell you, Whisper Nation, that. Don't be afraid of DeAndre Swift. Now, don't take him in the second round. I'm not telling you that. Let this information sink in. Let people panic. Let his ADP drop. Because guess what? When the draft comes around, people are going to be saying this. Oh, Jamal Williams, the 1A. Oh, they got Todd, potentially Todd Gurley. Oh, uh, you know, the defense is bad. Okay, well, let me ask you this. And let me just point out a couple of things. Anthony Lynn is known for, you know, like Travis said, the, the running back backfields that he's had. Oftentimes, what have we seen in those running back backfields? It's the running back that's the most electric and the pass catching running back. That would be DeAndre Swift. The other thing I want to note is that DeAndre Swift, it's in OTAs right now, but DeAndre Swift has already been, they've been saying he's one of the best players at OTAs. Now they don't, straight up pad up or anything, but they do, you know, go out there and have them run drills and things like that. And I think it's very important to say this. So uh, this was a quote coming from a beat reporter, right? Safe to say Swift did not look, uh, did not at all look out of place when lined up on the outside. This is why it's important. This is why I still think DeAndre Swift is not being seen at his true value. We're going to talk about the lack of weapons here in the rest of this segment, but DeAndre Swift's Precision and short area quickness stood out among the running backs during route running drills. In seven on seven drills, Swift was unstoppable. Trey Flowers, who uh, was his first victim, as Swift, Swift quickly gained three steps on the edge defender, who will be asked to drop in coverage more this season. Then Swift beat Alex and uh, Anzalone over the middle during the next session. Swift is a matchup problem for defenses, and I'm not sure there will be a single player on the Lions uh, defense who can cover him right now. Well, yeah, that mean, was, like, yeah. And I let's no, talk I, about the I, fact that the Lions defense I do. is probably a practice squad, but still, it, yeah, I, I it definitely is. And the last, here's just the last part I want to kind of hammer home and, and really make my case. We've all, we talk about these one a and one B guys. Okay. Let's talk about them. Let's bring them up. 
Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Those are two excellent running backs. Nick Chubb still going in the first round. We think he could be the number one overall running back. He splits time. Uh, let's look at Alvin Kamara, who's he's, you know, DeAndre Swift's been comp to in this backfield. You know, oh, we got Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram or uh, at Latavius Murray. Okay. I'm pretty sure the last time I checked, the last three years, Alvin Kamara has been taken top 10 in drafts and he's finished top 10 as far as the running back position goes. When you have electric running backs that are skilled and are going to stay on the field because their defense is bad, they need to pass. Who's the pass catcher there? It's going to be DeAndre Swift because he is the most electric. He's the most elusive. All these things are tying in to say, all right, this is going to be DeAndre Swift. Is going. This is why he's going to be so good in this system. And, you know, you can look at these other pieces and say, uh, and point them out. But if you, if you just look at the skill, what those positions tend or what that information tends to lead to, it will point out that DeAndre Swift still has a tremendous upside. And Lynn has already said he's going to, he's going to quote unquote, go with the hot hand. Well, I'll tell you who's going to have a hot hand often, and that's going to be DeAndre Swift because we all saw what this what this kid could do last year on a a bad uh, Detroit Lions team. This offense could be just as you know. I'm not saying they're going to pass as much. I think they're going to run more because they have Goff and they off they upgraded that offensive line, which was already ranked number 11 last year. Travis, they got the best offensive lineman in the draft. That signifies to me they're going to run a lot. So with that said, I do think that DeAndre Swift is going to end up being a steal in drafts because his ADP will get uh, knocked down because of all this information. Yeah, the, I have a, I have problems with this, Johnny, and I, I think let it out. This I is get, I get what you're out. saying, and I think you know, as your podcast partner, I probably hear more than anyone uh, your take on Swift all the time, and so yeah, I get that. My problem is, you you know, you you do this job of comparing him to the 1A, 1Bs of the league, and that's fine. Even look at the Chargers. You could talk about 1A, B with Melvin Gordon, who was coached by Anthony Lynn, and then Austin Eckler in the time that they cross paths. All three of those teams, though, the Saints, the Chargers, and the, and the Browns, much better teams and much better situations than what's going on in Detroit right now or what's projected to go on in Detroit. Now, I will say Goff has a nice history of throwing to his backs. You look at Todd Gurley in his heyday there. Um, there's some combinations of, you know, Dan Campbell used to coach for the Saints, so he should understand how to use both backs and, and impart that on Anthony Lynn, who has his own experience doing it. And I love all that, too. Uh, I just think there's going to be this marriage of the thought process that happens here between will Deon – look, there's no – we're going to talk about this, but I'll bring it up now. The Detroit Lions have the most available targets to make up for from last year. 360 targets. Okay, Johnny, that is 120 targets more than any other team that they have to make up for in this year. Okay, that's 64% of their target market share from last year. They have to figure out where that goes this year. Now, a couple things play into that. Jared Goff is not Matthew Stafford. But a couple things play in it for the other side. This defense is bad. So I do think they're going to throw more. So I do think that there is validity to saying that DeAndre Swift is going to be a guy that soaks up a lot of targets. One, we've already seen it. Johnny, you've pointed that out eloquently this offseason. We've already seen him last year. That was how he made most of his money anyways in a limited role. I just wonder if there's going to be enough rushing capability to even it out. Do we think that there's going to be – I think that's the money. And how much is that worth it as a guy who's probably going to be not just a scat back but an elite scat back for them and a guy that's going to be very good in the passing game? And so, yes, do I need this to drive down his ADP? Yes, and we'll talk about that now. I mean, Jamal Williams is the guy that everybody's scared about. This is a guy who you've you know been on this show saying, like, are we scared of Jamal Williams? Like, he didn't do anything for Aaron, Aaron Jones, but once again, a better situation. Let's talk about the quote that Anthony Lynn said here. So in quotes, he says, Jamal is what I'd call a classic A-back, Lynn told Chris Burke and Nick Bumgardner of The Athletic. I like to break the backs down to into A and B. I mean, this is sophisticated stuff here. My <laughs> A-backs are normally my bigger backs. They can run between the tackles, block probably a little bit better than the B-back. They can also run the perimeter. I can leave those guys in there for all three downs. Matthew Barry quotes Chris Burke, who also quoted him again, and said Anthony Lynn says he's going to ride the hot hand at running back. If you go in the game and you're balling, you're going to stay in there. 
Matthew Barry's take on this was bless Anthony Lynn for continuing to drive down DeAndre Swift's ADP. Swift is still the most talented RB on the team and will be used a lot. To me, the bigger takeaway is that Jamal Williams, who is a lot better than he gets credit for, will be a nice value late in drafts. I disagree that Jamal Williams is going to be a late value in drafts. This team is not going to run enough for people to have value in that guy. Now, is he going to be more like a Jordan Howard that gets like a goal line carry here and there? Yeah, but he's not going to be a guy that you're going to want in. I do believe you're going to want Swift. I think the sweet spot is beginning, of, or I'd say middle of the third to the fourth is where you're going to want to take DeAndre Swift because I do think he's going to be like a perfect RB2 flex option for you, but he's not going to be this RB1 that he was being drafted as early in the year because I just don't think this team's good enough to support that. The touchdown opportunities aren't going to be there as plentiful as people think, and the rushing ability for Swift himself doesn't seem like it's going to be there for him, but the pass-catching ability will be, and especially in PPR, I think you should be willing to invest. Anything you want to counter there with DeAndre Swift at the end, or do you want to say anything on the Jamal Williams front, Johnny? I do want to say on the Jamal Williams front, I I would disagree that I wouldn't be interested in drafting him. I think if his ADP is is, is at the right price, like I'm not going to draft him in the seventh round or anything like that, but uh, I, I'm not familiar with his ADP at the moment. I apologize, but I, you know, I can't imagine it's like 12th, 13th round. I think as a handcuff or as that 1A, I mean, you got to think about it, you know, like where are we taking 11th round they, in, in, in 12 and 12 team leagues? 11th round RB45. I, I, I just, I do see that there is an upside. Let's say something does happen to DeAndre Swift, uh, you know, God forbid. I will say that we have seen, you know, Jamal come in here and when he's, when he gets, you know, 19, 16 carries. He finished as the RB6, RB10. Um, looking down here, he had 17 carries week 12 against Chicago. He finished as the RB18. And so the, he does have some upside value for sure as a handcuff. And I, I think that that's more so where his value is. I don't know if I'm grabbing him to be like, oh, he's going to be a, you know, an RB3 that I'm going to throw in my lineup every once in a while. I think it's just like, okay, it's a handcuff that he does have potential with. He's a guy that he can actually get the work done and get the job done. I think that's where his value is. But I, you know, I do understand if I'm, if I'm not a DeAndre Swift, you know, someone who drafts DeAndre Swift, chances are I'm probably not going to draft Jamal yeah, Williams because what is the upside, you know? upside yeah. pick for you? If you're like, oh, uh, something needs to happen to Swift and yeah. you got to rely on the, on the, on the Lions to be a really run heavy team. That's just going to run it down your throats. It's like, yeah, bro, when they go to third and seven and can't throw it and complete it, it doesn't matter because they're right. not going to have the ball again. So 100%. I think that's the bigger, bigger thing here. Um, not to spend too much time on the Lions, but we'll talk a little bit about these wide receivers, Johnny, because Amon Ross St. Brown is a very popular rookie pick in Dynasty drafts because he should be grandfathered into a lot of work. We talked about the massive amount of targets that Detroit's trying to make up this year. But Brashad Perriman's a guy that's been gaining a lot of noise lately as a guy who's over there in Detroit right now, can do the deep route, has been a very highly graded wide receiver over the last couple of years. Remember when he got drafted by Baltimore, he said, I'm worth the wait because he dealt with drops to be on, he would actually be kind of true. Like he has been worth the wait. Some time in Tampa Bay, some time in New York. How do you feel about Rashad Perriman, the change of scene? Any value in him actually being the guy more likely to recoup these targets than the new rookie coming in? I think you just hit it on the head there, Travis. Uh, if I'm going to be drafting one of the Detroit Lions wide receivers, it's going to be Brashad Perriman. Now, I do understand you'd say, well, why do you want to draft a, a Detroit Lions wide receiver? I do understand it's not going to wow people at the draft, but we I will say that Goff can get the job. Like, he can throw. He It's not like he can't throw. Uh, he yeah, had six Robert games. Robert Woods and yeah. Cooper Cup as top yeah. 15 wide receivers in three years there. Yeah, and he also had six games last year over 300 yards. The last two years, he's been top 20 in, in passing touchdowns um, and so and, and top 15 in passing yards. So he can definitely throw the ball around. It's not, and reports are out of camp that Goff is looking good. Now it's again seven on seven camp with against the Detroit that Lions yeah. defense. <laughs> yeah, real real fierce. It's I need not to get the out LA there Rams the Lions defense, yeah. man. It's not the LA Rams. Big Travi looking they, good next to the it, Lions defense. <laughs> Um, so what I'll say with Brashad Perriman, I do agree that he's probably my favorite late, one of my favorite later round, uh, dart throws because he's had a career average of 8.8.1 yards per target and 63 appearances. And he's got a 49% catch rate, which isn't tremendous, but it as an alpha wide receiver who does get, you know, more bombs and that's how he's been kind of been used. 
you know, that will adjust when he gets more used as an X wide receiver where you're getting more of the closer uh, catches to the line of scrimmage, right? Goff already has reportedly uh, had chemistry with Brashad Perriman in these camps. He hit him on a long ball, uh, I guess, in camp that would have went for a, a touchdown. They said if it were a real game, whatever <laughs> you know that means as well. Oh, but man. here's the last here's the last thing I'll, I'll just say on on Brashad Perriman, Travis, and that is he was a top forty wide receiver in thirty three percent of his games last year with the Jets. Robert Woods, who I presume he would take over kind of the Robert Woods role for Goff. Wood saw 130 targets last year from Goff and averaged 15.2 fantasy points per game in PPR. Woods was a top 40 wide receiver 63% of the time with Goff. Now, am I saying he's going to be that exactly? No, you know, somewhere is that in the kind middle, of, though, right? I think somewhere, somewhere in the, the middle. middle. And and the fact that you're getting him, you know, you're you're drafting him outside of the wide, top 40 wide receivers. I think he's a great dart throw later on in drafts who he's going to be the number one. The one thing I want to touch on with Amon Ra St. Brown, I do want to pump the brakes on him a little bit and tell Whisper Nation to because he, you know, he is still battling out with Quintess Cephas, who they drafted uh, last year, and they also have Khalif Raymond that he's battling out. So we don't even know if he's truly going to get that slot role right away. And he's a rookie, you know, rookie wide receiver. So I don't even know if I'd be drafting Ramon because uh, I feel like he'll be a guy that you'll find on waivers after a couple weeks. Yeah, I would avoid Amon uh, in non-rookie formats, non-dynasty formats. Right. I think he is a decent ad in, in a lot of dynasty formats just to see if he can come into that mm -hmm. uh, volume. Uh, I think the big play here is we're going to be talking about Hawkinson and DeAndre Swift is the guy who should be eating up the 64% of the market share that's coming in. And Hawkinson was a tight end five with not anywhere near that amount of available targets. So really, I don't think we need to overthink this. Hawkinson is fine at the ADP he's going at. You could actually take him around early in my mind because you could bank on the upside. And I think you should be, you know, he's one of my favorite tight ends to invest in because I think it's a no-brainer. We've seen what Goff was able to do with Higby, especially when Higby was in there without Everett. And mm -hmm. I think that's the important thing to lean on is just that Hawkinson's good at football. And this team needs to replace a lot of targets with people that are good at football. And that's Swift and that's Hawkinson. And that's who I think, you know, we can play games about Perriman who's not being drafted. And I think he'll be a fine dart throw late in drafts. But we really need to bank on who is more likely to get those targets. And it's Hawkinson and Swift for me uh, in that in that realm. All right. Before we move on to the last two teams in this division, I want to talk to Whisper Nation once again. We are nothing without your unwavering support. Johnny mentioned Patreon at the top of the show. If you feel it upon your heart to help us and continue to grow this family and chase this dream, consider joining us over on Patreon.com. You can show support at the $5 and $10 levels. The patron benefits include access to our exclusive Discord channels, entries to sport card giveaways, increased odds for landing spots in our 2021 Listener League, which we are working on giving away one of those spots next Monday on the Mock Draft, Mock Draft Monday show. Uh, we also have bonus content that's only available to our patrons. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Fantasy Whispers today and join the nation. Johnny, we got to talk about our Green Bay or my Green Bay Packers, not yeah. ours. My Green Bay Packers next. And look, the biggest storyline, I could talk to you about how Matt LaFleur is the most winning coach in, in NFL history through his first two seasons. I could talk to you about how this team was in the NFC Championship and one of the most efficient offenses. I could even talk to you about how Aaron Rodgers was the MVP last year and looked really good, and he's a great value in fantasy football drafts. But I can't talk about any of that because the man, Aaron Rodgers himself, is in a dilemma here with the Packers. Uh, rumors ha rumor has it as he's not happy with them. And when he went on Kenny Main Sports Center, he said essentially that it's all about the front office in, in not so many words. And we have an offense here that is really just so good in a lot of ways at different levels between Aaron Jones and Devontae Adams, even Robert Tunyon, who we'll get into a little bit as well. But all of that, Johnny, is so predicated on the man, the myth, the legend Aaron Rodgers coming in there. Look, uh, if we were to know today that he's going to play, I'd tell you draft him right now at ADP, but I have no idea if he's going to be in there, and I have no idea what's going to happen. My gut, my gut feeling is he plays for the Packers this year. He's mm -hmm. going to play for them. He's going to be the week one guy. I think he played a little bit of mind games, Johnny, with them at the initially to say, look, oh, hey, Brian Gutekunst, this is your, your job. Your job is to flip and draft people on this night. You worked all year for this draft. Watch me screw that up by saying I don't want to be there. So he leaks it that night. It gets with him. Now it's just about playing this game in the media. But they have all the leverage, man. They got the contract. 
yeah, he could he could retire retire do uh, Jeopardy, but th- you know they can just kind of hold close, and they've said and they've leaked that they don't want to trade him. So, mm. look, monitor the situation closely, and then go from there. I think we should we break down these Packers as if Aaron Rodgers is playing. And so that means let's talk first about Aaron Jones and this backfield and how you feel about Aaron Jones going snugly at the end of the first beginning of the second, uh, Aaron Rodgers in there. That's a great, that's a great spot for him, right? Uh, Aaron with Aaron, Aaron Jones as one of the top 12 running backs coming off the board, Travis, I think he continues to get disrespected each and every single year. You know, I almost came in with the joke like, Oh, AJ Dillon's there, you know, should we, should we be real nervous? You know, is he going to be the one a, um, (laughs) and you know, I, Aaron Jones continues to prove why he's such a great running back. He's super elusive. Travis RB five and PPR and standard. He, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers loves him. He was Aaron Rodgers was trying to get him more playing time years ago before, you know, he broke onto the scene. And when you're talking about a high end running back, Travis, I understand that there is some hesitancy because they are so efficient. And that is why they're getting, you know, all this, uh, you know, they're getting their production is off of efficiency. And we tend to like production off of, you know, the actual workload and the targets that you're getting. But Aaron Jones continues to pro- prove pre- people wrong. I think we're continuing to see this in the NFL as far as with other running backs as well, that the added targets, the added rushes don't necessarily mean that you're going to get a much more significant uh, production out of those players. So I think Matt Nagy has figured it out. That offense, uh, it, it runs. And I, I think that, you know, we are going under the presumption that Aaron Rodgers will be back. I do believe he will be just like Travis does, but I will even go out and say that I believe that even if Aaron Rodgers isn't there, I still think that Aaron Jones is still going to be a good value because people will come off of him. His ADP will drop, but like I said, that system is still really good. And I trust in Matt LaFleur's system. And, you know, as long, you know, I don't have to worry about a quarterback too much turning around and handing the ball off or just, you know, most quarterbacks can dump off. Well, no yeah, problem. I mean, just take a look at a David Montgomery who we think if Andy Dalton starts, let's say if Andy Dalton started right. the whole year, we'd still be drafting David Montgomery probably around where he's going. And mm-hmm. if that's the case, then like we got to love Aaron, Aaron Jones because he's better than David Montgomery by all measurements so far in the NFL, which means that we'd be taking him around that area. And I think that's a bargain. That's something I haven't heard enough of with the Aaron Rodgers take is that Jones actually is going to retain some of his value, even if Aaron Rodgers isn't in the lineup. A guy that we can't really say the same about is uh, Devontae Adams, Johnny, who right now is going in the middle of the first round, uh, presuming that Aaron Rodgers is in this, uh, you know, (laughs) is playing for the Packers. But I want to talk about Devontae Adams. it's it's hard. This this projecting this team is so hard, Johnny. Because what do we do with Devonte Adams if he's not in the lineup? If Aaron Rodgers is not in the lineup, you panic. You panic. Yeah. Uh, that's that's the whole coming thing. Coming from a guy who owns him in Dynasty. Yeah, exactly. No, I, here. Well, in Dynasty, here's what I would say. In Dynasty, I would I would use that information if that happens, and I would actually go out and try to acquire Devontae Adams at that point because I don't see his value going any lower because, one, people are going to be like, okay, it's not Aaron Rodgers throwing the ball, and who knows how good he's going to actually be if somebody else is throwing him the ball. And so I would use that information to go get him because he only has one more year left on his contract, Travis. And I guarantee you, I almost like the Charles Barkley guarantee. (laughs) I guarantee that if Aaron Rodgers is not the quarterback, Devontae Adams is not resigning there. Or unless they really show that, you know, Jordan well, Love is said the guy. As much, he kind of said as much to uh, Cal- Colin Cowherd. He said, look, if he doesn't, uh, if he's not here, then it would affect my decision. I mean, of course it would. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't it? Yeah. And so I think that you could use that information because most people don't really necessarily know that information. You know, like he only has one year left on his contract, things like that. And you can get him a little bit cheaper because it's up in the air. Now, there, uh, to me, I think there's, a really good, obviously, if he's paired with Aaron Rodgers, I think it'll be a fun battle between him and A.J. Brown as to who ends up being the wide receiver one. 
But in reality, Travis, we've seen this often where it actually could end up benefiting Adams if Rodgers does leave and his ADP does come down significantly, because it will, you know, if they have either Blake Bortles or Jordan Love throwing the quarter, uh, throwing the ball. But we've seen this with, you know, guys like DeAndre Hopkins and guys like Larry Fitzgerald, Portland like these top, Sutton. yeah, these top, top wide receivers where you just get them a quarterback who can somewhat throw it in their direction and they're going to be fine. They're going to get most of the targets because that's where the quarterback is going to throw the few times that he has to throw. And so we've seen Devontae Adams, you know, destroy double coverage, destroy all these things. And Blake Bortles also, we can't, as much as we just say, you know, I was hit trashing on the guy. Allen Robinson, like he, Allen Robinson was the top 12 that's quarterback. Under stay him. There. Yeah. Wide receiver, I should say. Yeah. All right, I want to talk quickly about Amari Rogers before I kick it over to you, Johnny, for the Robert Tunyon talk because I, I'm just excited about Tunyon. And I know you got some stuff there to to back that up. Amari Rogers is a guy who's dynamic slot weapon who we could actually see go into like a Randall Cobb type role for them. 68 slot catches last year in college football that led all of college football. 25 of which of those slot catches got 15 or more yards. That was first. He posted 613 yards after the catch. That was second among all wide receivers behind Devontae Smith. Look. Amari Rodgers is a weapon, and if Aaron Rodgers is throwing him the ball, this is a guy who can really get it done. This is a guy I'm actually way more excited than I ever was for MVS or for Alan Lazard or for any or for Geronimo Allison, any of these guys that came in and were paired with Aaron Rodgers, and that's because Amari Rodgers played with elite quarterback talent at Clemson. He played in systems where, you know, they get him the ball in space. And Rodgers is one of the best in throwing to those guys. Think Randall Cobb with him and think about stashing him late. I was looking at him in a lot of dynasty drafts just in case the Rodgers makes up with Green Bay and fulfills the entirety of his contract. Then you've got Amari Rodgers to come in here. And who wouldn't love, as Aaron Rodgers, an egotistical guy? Rodgers yeah. to Rodgers, baby. You know he yeah. wants to do it all day long. So I love and Amari then it Rodgers. Would it would definitely be a discount double check then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's where I'm at. Robert Tunyon, Johnny, busted on the scene last year with a ton of touchdowns. I wrote about him in my offseason article that was favorite players to watch, some of my favorite players to watch. Bobby Tunyon, uh, we love this guy. Rogers called him Kittle Jr., an ascending player. And you've got some news about Matt LaFleur and how they want to use Robert Tunyon. How excited are you about Bobby Tunyon this year? I'll be honest. I was a little skeptical at first, Travis, uh, when you were talking uh, about, you know, Robert Tunyon and, and you had thought that maybe he could see another bounce up a uh, year or, or outproduce what he did last year. And I thought it was a little bit wild because I was like, this guy had some really good weeks. Like he really outperformed his, his ADP and, and his draft last year. Obviously you got him off the waivers, but like I definitely didn't think his his streak would continue. But once again, you talked about those lack of weapons that they really went out and get. Yeah, sure, they went out and got Amari Rodgers, but I'm not 100% sold that he's going to soak up a ton of targets and be that guy that all of a sudden comes in and is the second target getter for Green Bay Packers. I actually am starting to come around on the idea, like you are, that uh, Robert Tunyon is going to be one of those guys that I'm going to stash later on in drafts and, and take the dart throw on him later because we have seen what the upside is of this guy, especially if a, if he gets behind, you know, Rodgers gets behind him and wants to pump him up like like he's been doing. He had uh, five touchdowns in his first three weeks, so that's that upside is definitely there. And, uh, you know, you, like you said, you saw that rapport with Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers really targeted him, you know, down the stretch. I just wanted to point this out. Matt Sharani, uh Schneid Schne yeah, Schneidman, thank you, uh, <laughs> reported this. He said LaFleur want. Uh, he tweeted this out a couple of days ago. Matt LaFleur says he wants to feature Robert Tunyon in the offense more in 2021. Says Tunyon has improved more than anyone on the team since he became head coach. So when you're talking about, you know, he's a coaches like him, quarterback likes him. And the targets are definitely there because they don't have a major second piece, Travis. Tunyon could really be a nice breakout tight end that you know people didn't believe in, but there there is a very good path to being a top five tight end once again. I think I'm kind of buying the tea on him with you, Travis. 
Yeah, I just think, especially after that comment, like that's Coach Peak you want to hear, mm -hmm. that he improved the most. And then you talked about Aaron Rodgers. You know, Rodgers has a history of talking up guys that don't end up being anything. But Tunyon is a guy who showed it on the field, who has practiced work ethic with George Kittle. Like they're friends. So they understand what it takes to be at the position and do it well. And so that's what excites me about Tunyon. And then obviously we talked about the need for that second option, which is another reason. Like I'm just going to get on my soapbox here a little bit. Why are we crying about the weapons for Rodgers? What, what's the real big deal here? Devontae Adams, Robert Tunyon, Aaron Jones. I mean, as far as, far as fantasy, fantasy is concerned, top five in, at their position all the way down the board. So, yeah, I know that doesn't equate to real football, but these are some weapons. And we've been in the NFC Championship for two years in a row. This is a team that's pretty good around Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, it doesn't make the splash plays in the draft, but things have kind of worked out. I just feel like it's a little bit off base to be coming in here saying that they're not a good I, offense. I think it's just more pointed out because, you know, you had Justin Jefferson and you had these uh, these wide receivers that were available couldn't, last couldn't year. Have, couldn't have got Jefferson, though. He was drafted ahead. Right. And, I mean, there, there but, were some guys that went that we could have taken a, a look at for sure. And like maybe we draft DK Metcalf the year before. You know, and there's there's definitely yeah. things that as every team. Yeah. But that's know. what everybody's saying. Right. And, right. And Devonte Adams is being talked about as the number one wide receiver in the league. And then you talk about a guy in Aaron Jones is being talked about a top five running back in the league. They went and spent the money to keep Aaron Jones there. And we're still getting hearing that, oh, they don't get Rodgers any help. I don't know, man. It just seems like it seems a little bit uh, low hanging fruit to me. But we'll move on to our last team here. And that's the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, you, we start with all these teams at, with the pat or with the 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 signal callers, but I want to talk a little bit about the Vikings. They're kind of the vanilla of the NFC North, only because they haven't changed much. We know what they want to do. They want to run with Dalvin Cook. They want to throw deep with Kirk Cousins, and they want to lose football games. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I would just say that Kirk Cousins is going to be what he always we thought he was. He's a top twelve option. You're you're definitely going to be worried. You know coming in there and streaming him he's a no he's everybody's love lover boy in two quarterback leagues because if you wanted to get your first quarterback and then wait and get Kirk Cousins you're going to be sitting pretty we don't have much to discuss on Kirk Cousins we know what he is he's shown us I want to talk about I thought Joe I mean Joe Zolo said it the best on it we had him on a show a couple of weeks ago Travis and he said it the best with Kirk Cousins. It doesn't matter if it's a good matchup, a bad right. matchup. Like the dude just gonna get you like 17, you know, 20 points, and it's it's frustrating. And that's just the way it is. And yeah, every so once in a while, like, you like sticks. Adjust expe expectations there. And we don't have much to see even with Dalvin Cook. I do want to speak a little bit about how good he was, man. Eight 20 plus point games and half point PPR. He had four games with two or more touchdowns. RB2 in PPR, RB3 in standard, 100 or more all-purpose yards in nine games. This is a guy who got the injury knock, but after 15 total games in those first two seasons, he's come back with back-to-back -back years of 14 or more games. He There's a reason why he's being drafted as maybe the number one or the number two back in, in so many drafts. He should, Travis, I, uh, that's what I want to bring up right here. Whisper Nation, I'm going to look you right in the camera here and tell you this, eye to eye. You need to take Dalvin Cook at the 101. It should be, there shouldn't be, oh, should I take CMC? Should I take, no, it's Dalvin Cook, number 101, because they just got uh, uh, in the draft. They just upgraded their offensive line, which was the biggest uh, weakness as far as Dalvin Cook. We talked about how explosive Dalvin Cook was and how awesome he was last year. Well, guess what? The vast majority, he got hit more in the backfield than any running back. And he still was able to plow forward and, and break through tackles because he's he's so talented. Now imagine his offensive line can actually block for him because now they got those pieces in to actually do their job. And you're going to see so many more open running lanes. You're going to see Dalvin Cook running wild. Like Travis said, they want to run the ball. And then they want to set it up with the play action so Kirk Cousins can take some deep shots. I'm telling you right now, Dalvin Cook – will be the one uh, RB1 uh, that you should take. I do think the dark horse, though, is Nick Chubb the, to finish RB1. But I do think Dalvin Cook, well, if, you're, if you're a betting man, Travis, a betting man or woman, uh, I would place my money on Dalvin Cook being the number one overall RB this year. 
Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you. I think Dalvin Cook's a great pick there. I do want to talk about these wide receivers, Johnny, because Justin Jefferson's a stud. Are you okay with his ADP? And are people sleeping on how good Adam Thielen can even be too? I think both of these guys survive and, and play great roles for this offense, and I think that's where you go with it. I think I'm fine at ADP for both of these guys, but talk a little bit about them. Yes, for, when it comes to ADP for me, I just, you know, we we dove in into how many times in, in the comp of Justin Jefferson and how rare of a season he had. And, and you know, the comp is OBJ. That's it. That's the only other comp that you could say a rookie wide receiver came in and, uh, and, and produced. The difference, however, is that next year OBJ was being, you know, taken as like the third or fourth wide receiver off the board. And Justin Jefferson's not that wide receiver this year because there's so many good wide receivers that he's being you know the eighth seventh wide receiver off the board and so for me I think that that is fine because I we have seen Kirk Cousins year in and year out what is his wider his number one weapon always ends up being a top 12 wide receiver as much as we hate Kirk Cousins and hate how he's you know uh, a frustrating fantasy quarterback he does get the job done for his wide receivers. And, you know, Adam Thielen has been that guy. I do have some concerns because of age and and his, you know, touchdown dependency last year. I think we're seeing a tides, uh, you know, a t a, the turn of the tides, I should say. And I do think that Justin Jefferson actually will be fine at his ADP. I think it could return about that. Might slide a little bit and he might finish as, you know, Wide receiver 10, wide receiver 11. Yeah, I think that that's probably more like the range of outcomes. But like I said, you're not going to be able to pass on Justin Jefferson like the third round and get him in the fourth. Like it's just not going to happen. So if you build that out and you say, I want Justin Jefferson, I, you know, just make sure your draft, your draft strategy kind of, you know, formulates with that saying, do you want to measure wide receiver one? Do you want to measure wide receiver two? I'd prefer him as my wide receiver two. Because even if he does kind of regress from last season, you're okay a little bit. But I, I still ultimately think he finishes no worse, no worse than a wide receiver 15. So I think you're you're pretty good. I love the Jefferson take. I just want to add a little bit on Thielen. So every time we talk about touchdowns in fantasy, we say, well, it's a volatile stat. I don't know if you can predict it. You can if that person that you're talking about either A, gets a lot of yardage and hasn't gotten touchdowns, you can kind of predict some progression for that, right? Or positive regression. B, if he gets red zone targets. And this was the argument with Cooper Cup a lot of the time was, oh, Cooper Cup, he takes touchdowns. But he was Jared Goff and Sean McVay's favorite target in the red zone. Okay, and that's what I'm seeing here out of Adam Thielen. 20 targets last year in the red zone. That was number three among wide receivers last year. Number three in touchdowns as well. That's not a coincidence. This is a guy that, Adam Adam Thielen is looked to by Kirk Cousins in the red zone. So I think, yes, you can kind of predict that that should stay the same because of the connection they have. And if there is a drop-off, I mean, it kind of, we kind of saw it with Jordy Nelson and Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, the, the speed dropped off, but the touchdowns didn't because he liked him in the red zone. And we've talked, we'll talk about the tight ends, but this isn't something that Kirk Cousins has loved in the red zone. So why not Adam Thielen in the red zone? You let Justin Jefferson do all the work to get you there or have the big play, but Thielen can still do work that he needs to do. And he's still a bargain. He continuously gets checked, uh, slept on. Last note here is on Irv Smith. I know people want this to happen, but he only saw 8% of the team's market share with 43 targets. He only played in 12 games. The big sell will be that Rudolph is leaving, but he himself and Kyle Rudolph only saw 7% or 37 targets. If Smith were to get all of that, he's still probably looking at top 12, top 15 action, not, not anything we're going to really write home about. I don't think that Smith is the guy you want to invest big in. I don't mind him as your second tight end taken at the end of your draft to see if maybe something happens. But this offense, we know what it is. It runs with Dalvin Cook. It throws to Justin Jefferson, then Thielen, then Cook. And I think, you know, Irv Smith in the tight end position in this offense, just kind of the odd man out. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I wanted to get on that bandwagon with you, Travis, uh, but I'm I'm with you. I don't know if I see him actually being able to jump into, you know, the top seven tight ends. If you're going to hang your hat on something, you could hang, on, hang it on the fact that he has like a 25% red zone usage when, and that was when he had Irv, or uh, Kyle Rudolph there. 
but they did also bring in some other tight ends. So uh, there have been beat reporters saying that they're actually not planning on, you know, increasing Irv Smith's usage usage significantly like we all hope. And so, yeah, for that reason, I'm with you, man. I'm out on Irv Smith this year. Yeah, I would agree with that. Well, you can't be out on the Fantasy Whispers because we're here every day and you got to keep coming to us. So make sure you subscribe over on YouTube or get us wherever you get your podcasts. Johnny, you got any last minute talk for the people? I'm just going to. No, I don't actually. Have a good oh, week. I thought you were going to plug DeAndre Swift there one more time, but we'll <laughs> I, uh, we'll let it go here. That would have been a good, good one. Yeah, have a good weekend. Get over to the fantasywhispers.com and download the draft kit for only $10 instead of 15 For Johnny Game Time Hicks, I'm Big Travi. We're the Fantasy Whispers, and we're out. Peace. Peace. Right here. Oh, hey, you made it to the end of the video. If you like what you saw, go ahead and hit subscribe. Make sure you hit that bell so you get notified anytime we drop new content or go live. And if you're still not told yet, check out one of these videos.